as of end of July this year, there are close to 180,000 registered refugees and asylum seekers in Malaysia. What comes to mind when we talk about refugees? They are just like us. And if given the right opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, they could be farmers, businessmen, university graduates, engineers, doctors, or even politicians. But most of all, refugees are great survivors. Each of them has a remarkable story to tell, a story of hope and resilience. Today, we will hear the story of a young social activist and how he set out to change the life for refugees. Please put your hands together for Hassan Al-Akra. Before I begin, let me tell you a bit about myself. I am 20 years old. I came from a town called Aleppo in Syria. I arrived in Malaysia in 2012 with my family as refugees from Syria because of the war. Let me take you on a journey with me. In that photo you see up here, this photo was taken in 2005 at my grandmother's house. This is me and my cousins, and that is the garden of my grandmother uh, at her house. Our life before the war was as happy as you could ever imagine. We had everything. And what I mean by everything is that we had a home, friends, and family. And these three things were my everything at that time. My father used to work at a construction company and my mom was a housewife. My siblings and I would go to school every day. We also had a farm. Our life was as happy as you could ever imagine. Until 2011, when the war started. I started watching TV and seeing the news of the war that started in a town that was not very far from my hometown. And I started getting worried. I was 11 years old at that time, and I didn't understand what is happening. One day in summer in 2011, we would sleep at the rooftop of the house. At night, we would watch the stars, the sky. The whole family were there. We were telling each other stories until suddenly we saw fireballs flying above our heads and hitting the village right next to us. That is when I realized those were bombs. The sound was just very, very loud. We quickly ran downstairs. We hide underneath the house. We hide together with, at the place where our sheep and goats were sleeping. The next morning we went out, it was very quiet. We looked at the village next to us. It was completely destroyed. Fire was everywhere. A lot of people from that village came and seek asylum at our village. It was not very far. That is when my parents decided to leave the country and seek asylum. A lot of people ask, why did we chose Malaysia? Before the war in Syria in 2006, there was a Malaysian family who were studying in Syria. They took all of their children, five children, husband and wife. We met them at the mosque and we got to know each other and we became really close. We became really close friends. Then they started having financial difficulties and they could not afford to pay the rent anymore. So we took them in to stay in our home. My family and this Malaysian family lived together in the same house for over three years. We became like one family. And when the war started, they watched the news and they are the one who texted us and said, come to Malaysia, it's safer here. It goes in a circle. You help, help comes back to you. You do good, good will come back to you. And that's exactly what happened to us. My family decided to leave the country and come to Malaysia because of the war. It was one of the very most difficult days in our lives, which is to say goodbye to our beloved ones, our relatives, our uncles and aunties, my friends, my grandparents. We are saying goodbye without knowing will we ever see them again. 
We took the bus from Aleppo to the capital city, Damascus. From the bus window, I looked and I saw a horrible views of houses being bombed, schools and hospitals are destroyed. I even saw dead bodies on the ground. And then I had a thought in my head. Why am I leaving? Why am I running away? This is my country. This is my land. I need to stand there. I need to fight for it. I need to protect it. What am I afraid of? And then an, a very different thought hit my head. If all the young people my age hold a gun and fight in a battlefield and they died in the war, who is left to rebuild the country? So I had a choice, either to fight for my country, which is holding a gun and fight, or to learn, get education, and help rebuild my country. But I want you for a minute to think. If you were in my place, and you had to make one of these choices, what would you choose? There is no wrong or right answer. Both of these choices, you are protecting your country. This is based on your own personal feelings. We arrived at the airports and we arrived in Malaysia in 2012. The family welcomed us, the Malaysian family welcomed us from the airport and they took us to their home. We stayed there for a few weeks and then we moved out to a, a house rent. We went to a government school. The family, the Malaysian family that helped us took us to a government school nearby the home to register us. But we were rejected because we are not Malaysians. But the principal was very, very kind. I still remember him until this very day. A very kind gentleman who allowed my siblings and I to come to school every day, sit at the back of the class, just to listen and learn the Malay language. We were there for two weeks, and then we started getting bullied by the other students because we did not know how to understand them or how to reply them. So we stopped, and we stayed at home, and we decided to learn the language on our own. We started watching TV, reading newspaper, reading books, and then my father's health condition became bad, so he had to stop working at the restaurant. So then my brother and I, my eldest brother and I, decided to work to help the family. This photo is myself when I was 13 years old at a restaurant where I used to work. I was 13 years old at that time, and it was very difficult for me to work. My body couldn't take it 12 hours a day with a very, very little payment, but I didn't care. All I wanted to do was to protect and help my family to pay house rent and other bills. And in 2014, I worked at, as the cashier of that restaurant. My boss saw that I am improving my language and that I am I'm somehow I'm very good at communicating. So he decided to appoint me as the cashier of that restaurant. One day in 2014, as I was sitting right behind that cashier counter, a very tall and huge man came in and asked me, where is your passport? I told him my passport is at home, but I have the UN card. I showed him my UNHCR card, and he said, oh, you're a refugee, you're not allowed to work here. Sit here for a while. I sat there, then I realized there was a group of them. And they came in from all doors. And they wore a vest that says immigration. And they arrested all the other illegal workers in that restaurant. I was 14 years old when they handcuffed my hands, I started questioning in my head, what is my crime? I felt like a criminal, just like how I see it in the movies. That is how I felt. The moment we entered our cells, the smell is just terrible. Not only that, we all should sleep on the ground. The food, the food that was given to us was not even enough to feed a cat. For the first two, three days of me being there, I started becoming depressed. At such a young age, to endure such things were just unimaginable, but that is the reality that I had to go through. 
I started having thoughts, dark thoughts of committing suicide, wanting to end my life so that my suffering would end. Not to mention the abuse by some of the officers, not to mention the condition itself. There were so many sick people in there. On my third day of being there, a new group arrived and they put three of them in the same cell that I was in. There was 20 of us in that cell. They were younger than me. I was 14. These kids were 13, 12, and 11. I asked them, where did you come from? How did you end up here? They told me they spent months on boat coming all the way from Rhinia to Malaysia, hoping to start a new life. Some of them, they have seen their, their parents behaved in front of their eyes. Their house, everything was burnt down. The whole village was burnt down. When I heard their stories, I started telling myself, why am I complaining? Although I ended up being in the prison, although I ended up with this condition, at least I still have my parents out there who are alive. At least I have a family to go to. At least I have a UN card, and UN will release me soon. I have some sort of documentation, but them, they have nothing. They have no one. They could end up in, in the detention center for years. We became really close. We became friends. We always played together. We ate together inside the cell. On the ninth day of me being there, the immigration officer came and called my number and said, you're free. At that time, I didn't know either to feel happy or sad. Happy because I'm finally going out, I'm finally going to see the sunlight, I'm finally going to meet my parents, I'm finally going to be out of this hell. Sad because I'm leaving these kids behind. I'm leaving those friends behind. I went home, my parents were very happy to see me, I was very happy to see them, but I was still traumatized from the experience. And then I told myself, what can I do? I can't just sit there and blame myself. I can't just sit there and blame the world. I can't just sit there and give up. I can't just sit there and endure the trauma by myself. I have to do something. So I started going to refugee schools to volunteer my time as a teacher and also as a social worker. That was me as a teacher in various refugee schools in Malaysia. My main aim was to inspire these children to come to school every day with the hope that tomorrow will be better. And then from there, I started learning more and more about the projects, about the refugees in Malaysia, about the challenges that we as a community face. And I started you know, getting in, uh, in myself involved in NGOs and other charity work, hoping that it will help the situation. I started also giving workshops to people, trainings on how can they start their own social projects? How can they become volunteers? How can they, it's, it's more of motivation and inspiration. In 2016, I realized that my work is getting more and more, and I'm having more volunteers who are supporting the causes that I'm doing. So I said, why not I do it under an umbrella? So that is when I launched the Al Hassan Volunteer Network. Al Hassan in Arabic means goodness. So it basically means the Goodness Volunteer Network. In 2016, until now, we have had over 500 volunteers who are registered with us and who have volunteered with us. We run such as medical checkups. We bring in volunteer doctors and vo volunteer medical students to do a checkup at the community centers from time to time. Other projects such as uh, trips. This was Mother's Day event in 2018. We brought all the refugee mothers and their children, and we had a day full of fun and activities for their children and for them as uh, mothers. Other events we do, food basket distribution to families who are really, really in need. This was in uh, August this year, where we did a camp. It's called Camp Hope. Camp Hope basically is a two days camp aiming to improve the mental health situation amongst refugee teenagers. Refugee teenagers are the group that are always left out. And especially during MCO, a lot of them were going through depression to the point that I started receiving messages from their parents worrying about them. This was uh, last year, Hari Raya Eid, 
where we brought refugee communities from all nationalities together to have a dinner and a celebration of cultural performances and so on. Because we realized that refugees do not feel, most of them do not feel a sense of belonging here. They don't feel a sense of community compared to when they were back in their country. I also conduct workshops on how to fundraise. We are very active fundraising for emergency medical cases and other rental cases of refugees who have been evicted from their homes and refugees who need to pay hospital bills. And we have done over 200 cases in the past two years of over 300,000 ringgit have been collected for all of these cases. And it's still ongoing until this very day. We also, this is one of the very um, inspiring project for me, which is called Our True Colors. Our True Colors started at a refugee school in Sintol, where I went there and the place was very dark. The walls are just, the moment you step in, you can feel the sadness, you can feel the trauma. So since we started the first school, we did mural painting. We have gone through a lot of other centers, not just refugee schools, but even local Malaysian orphanage, old folks' homes, PPR centers, Orang Asli village. Most of these volunteers are Malaysian, but they are also what inspires me the most is that there are refugees themselves who volunteer with us at this kind of events and activities. In 2017, I was asking myself, what about me? I'm doing all this work for the community, what about myself? What about the promise that I made to my country that I want to study and get education and help rebuild my country? I can't do it without a proper education. And after that, I tried to apply for several universities. And last year, I got accepted into the University of Nottingham, Malaysia for a scholarship to study education. This is one of the happiest moments in my life where I get to study. And that is where I get to build the dream that I have, which is one day to go back to my country and help rebuild it. Now let's talk about the refugees in Malaysia. I'm sure most of you are aware about the struggles that refugees are facing in Malaysia. Some of the main issues is that access to work, legal work, healthcare, and education. Refugees in Malaysia are not allowed to work legally in this country, but how are they gonna survive? That is the question. A lot of NGOs are stepping in to provide support and help, but what about them being dependent on their own? They can't be dependent on charity all the time, and charity is not forever. Can you imagine a refugee who was a lecturer back in Afghanistan? She was a university lecturer, engineering lecturer in Malaysia, she can't use her qualification. She can't use it. So what does she do? She works from home, she cook, she makes sewing projects, and she sells them. Not just that, I have so many friends who were nurses, who were doctors, who were teachers, who were engineers, who graduated with qualifications, with really proper degree and masters, but they can't use it here. Let me ask you a question, most of you as Malaysians, do you want those refugees with qualification to work here in Malaysia, to give back to the society? Or would you rather have refugee children from such a young age growing up with no access to schools, with no access to education, and growing up started joining gangsters, started taking drugs, started doing bad things, stealing? Do you want that for your society? Most of the Malaysian friends I have asked, they would choose the second one, which is to provide education for the youngsters from such a young age so that they can grow up, and while they are still in Malaysia, why not give back to the country? And that is one of the things that I have been doing, providing opportunities to the refugees to give back to Malaysia. The future of refugees in Malaysia, of course, lies in the hands of the government to create a policy that would end the suffering of the refugees. But while waiting for that, we can't just be sitting and waiting for it. 
there is a lot of things that we can do. And a lot of Malaysians, my friends ask me, what can we do to help refugees? And I always tell them, number one thing that you can do that doesn't require any financial assistance from you, it doesn't require your energy, it doesn't require your skills, number one thing you can do to help the refugees in Malaysia is awareness. Start small. Start with your own circle of family, within your own circle of friends. Start with your own social media. You don't have to go on to big events to stage and talk about it. Start small, because that is what we all need. Another thing that you can do is, of course, volunteer at these refugee schools. We always tend to, when we want to help, we always look at money. We always look at power. We always look at those celebrities who are doing, you know, brilliant things and all that. And then we feel very small. We feel very incapable of doing things. But actually, when you look at your own power, when you look within your own self, you will realize that you can do as much as them. Join NGOs, help the NGOs with the programs that they run. Zuchi has a clinic in Pudu that helps refugees. Volunteer there if you have the time. And finally, if you are somebody who are capable to donate, then feel free to do so. A lot of cases that would need financial assistance that is when you can step in. Before I end my talk today, a lot of people always tell me, Hassan, you always complain about the immigration, you always complain about the system here. Why are you not grateful? Do you hate Malaysia that much? If you hate Malaysia that much, go back to your country. Personally, I love Malaysia as much as I love Syria. I was born in Syria, I grew up in Syria until I was 11 years old, and since then I moved to Malaysia and I grew up in Malaysia. Everything that is happening to me here is because of Malaysia, because I moved here. When I complain about the experience I've had at the immigration center, it does not mean that represents Malaysia. The act of one immigration officer towards me does not represent Malaysia. That is why I never judge a whole society by the action of you people. And that the same goes towards us refugees. If one or two individuals did something bad, doesn't mean the whole refugee community is bad. And the experience I've had here is nothing but to make me who I am today. Thank you so much for listening. It is often said that we are all created equal, regardless of our religion, culture, whether we are rich or poor, refugees or Malaysian. But if this is the truth, perhaps we should see refugees for who they are, regular people who are just fathers, mothers, sons, or daughters to someone. Like us, they too deserve to be treated with kindness, respect, and dignity. With that, I would like to thank Hassan for sharing his story. I hope we can all draw inspiration from him. And thank you all for joining us today.